and greetings everyone i'm mar once again this is my opinion as you can tell from the title up there it is another movie review and this one due to situation is much belated this was supposed to be done a couple months ago it's a patreon request once again for my buddy john and off the top john i would like to apologize sincerely for how much i procrastinated and pushed this back it's you know everything i put in the last video plus putting it off well, i'll do it tomorrow i'll do it tomorrow well i finally got around to revisiting this this has been a favorite of mine ever since i saw it and it is the inspiration behind one of my favorite songs from the blaze bear bailey era of iron maiden man on the edge this of course is falling down finally got this on dvd I haven't listened to the commentary with Michael Douglas and director Joel Schumacher yet, but that should be fun. Now, before I get too far into the video, just a reminder that if you want to support the channel, both the Patreon and PayPal links are down below. If you just want to do one-off support or a one-off request, go the uh, PayPal route. But if you want to continuously support the channel, gain access to videos early, and be able to suggest future video topics like this, go the Patreon route. Either way, your support is appreciated. Now, this movie was made for $25 million, and even with the big names you have in it, like Michael Douglas, Robert Duvall, I mean, you even got Rachel Ticotin in there, you could see a good amount of that money went up onto the screen. Like, I'd say, without having looked at it, I'd say probably at least 75 to 80% of the money is actually on the screen. Now, it did make money. But when you look at it with the whole Hollywood accounting thing I brought up time and time again, you could technically call it a flop. And the reason I say that is that it made $25 million, I mean, excuse me, it was made for $25 million and it made $40.9 million worldwide. And remember the whole thing, you got to make at least double your budget. So by that, it technically would have to make another 9 ish million in order to hit the break-even point, but... And again, that's usually the rule. We don't know how much the marketing was or if that's not factored into the $25 million. If it is, it made money. Just not a whole lot of it during its original release. And of course, with all the re-releases it's had in the 30 years since then, obviously it's made some its money back by now. Now, the plot of this film is it starts, seems to be in the middle of summer, heat wave in L.A. We meet our character, played by Michael Douglas, his nickname that is from his license plate is defends he seems to be like your typical person stuck in a traffic jam not liking it heat wave his air conditioner goes out he's annoyed by the flies and he just has a mental break and the beauty of this opening scene where we see this how it conveys this is how the camera it closes up on him it's moving a lot how it's quickly edited to show everything the traffic the heat the sounds of the city and how it just makes him crack to where he's just like in the words of Eric Cartman, screw you, these, I've been going home. So he gets out of his car, grabs a suitcase, and walks away. Now the fun thing about this, uh, let's see if I can find it in the notes real quick. I was going to save this for the trivia, but this is one little thing I love about this opening scene. and Something I never noticed the first time I watched it, but then I hadn't seen the film this is a tribute to until afterwards. But then reading that, watching again, I'm like, I see it. This whole opening sequence is a homage to the opening of Federico Fellinini's film, Eight and a Half. Which, if you haven't seen that, that's one of uh, Federico's films I definitely recommend every cinephile watch. And that's because that is a movie where the subtext and all that is about the difficulty of making movies. And that opening scene really sets the stage for that. Where you get the idea like, oh yeah, this is how it is making a movie when you had to deal with all the moving parts as a director and just how the, the way it's filmed and the way it's edited you kind of get that little tribute there it's a nice little way nice little wink wink on Schumacher's part now defense you would think oh he's just gonna be walking home he's having a mental break but on his way home he runs into basically about every bit of trouble you could think he does he runs into a gang of stereotypical cholos he runs into the stereotypical convenience store worker that raises the price above what the other stores do which is something that you expect so when you go and buy stuff from them you expect a markup regardless of ethnic background or who runs the store is expected 
the trouble with uh, fast food restaurants arbitrarily deciding when they are going to switch over from breakfast to normal menu. Which, I think for most places that actually sell breakfast is kind of a thing of the past now. Which is one of those things, that oh, that's a good change. And his main goal is to get home in time for his daughter's birthday. Now, as the film goes on, we see that not all is as it seems with defense. At first, you can tell he's probably a little on edge, not liking the traffic, starting to get warm. But as he goes further and further from his car towards home... You start to see that he is unhinged. You see that, first of all, he's divorced, so it's his ex-wife he's going to and his daughter. And he doesn't have a job, so why is he driving all that all that way? And I love the way that they subtly show that that's what it is when you pay attention to the newspaper he has and sees he has all the job advertisements circled. Nice little bit of a subtle set and prop foreshadowing. Even then, with all this, he still has his morals and all that. I mean... When he runs into the racist neo-Nazi guy that runs the military surplus store. That guy assumes, because of all the trouble he's gotten into with the people I mentioned already, that he is some type of racist vigilante who's trying to start a race war. But even then, he puts him in his place. You're like, yeah, defense. So that's one part where you're like, okay, this guy really deserves it. Then, of course, a little bit of social commentary about golf courses. Just the way Michael Douglas portrays that. I can't help but think of uh, George Carlin's little rant about uh, golf courses. Which, I, even though it kind of ties into my job and I don't want to go in there, I do kind of get what both Defense and Carlin are saying about golf courses. Even though there are people who are not rich or white who play golf, it's just not a pastime that I get. And I, to quote Carlin, Have you watched golf? It's like watching flies fuck. It's just... Not not my circus, not my monkey, not something I'm interested in playing. Miniature golf, maybe, but I just find miniature golf more entertaining than I do full-fledged golf. But that's just me. Now, as defense is going home, we're also cutting back to Robert Duvall's character, a sergeant Pendergast, or Pendergast, excuse me, who is on his last day on the force. He's going to be retiring. And as it goes along, we see part of it is because of some past things or... Some of his colleagues, especially his captain, are starting to say he's a desk jockey coward. See, part of it has to do with his wife, played by Tuesday Weld, who they seem to be having some issues. And part of the reason he's wanting to retire now and then move away is because of her. And one thing I do like is that by the end of the film, the sergeant does stand up to his wife, stands up to the captain on live TV, and stands up to everyone else. And you can see he's going to decide to hold off on retiring. So he pulls a Lethal Weapon 3, in a sense. The only difference is, with Lethal Weapon 3, we followed the character for two previous films, so we can kind of see why everything that's gone on would make him decide not to retire, even though, with everything we've seen, he probably should retire just to get some peace and quiet. Or is it this, following him on this one day, you're like, yeah, maybe staying might be some good for him, but it also might make things a lot worse. Who knows? And, of course, Rachel Ticotin's character, Sandra, another cop on the force, seems to be friendly with the sergeant. So it makes you wonder, hmm, I just wonder. Wonder, wonder, wonder. Of course, the captain's played by Raymond Barry, and he's the type of police captain you would not want to work under. Uh, he was in other things like Just Married and uh, Training Day. And, uh, and of course, uh, Defense's wife in the film is played by Barbara Hershey. She does a good job for the scene she's in there. You can tell she really is fearful of her ex. Uh, Joey Singer plays their daughter, Adele. And, you know, she, she is what she is. There's not really much of the character other than, I guess if you want to stretch it, she's kind of a MacGuffin. But that's about it. Now... Sergeant and defense never meet until the final scene. They're just playing that whole cat and... I don't know. Was it really a cat and mouse? I don't really think it would, I would call it a true cat and mouse. It's like they're parallel stories and they're converging. As defense is doing his little rampage that's inadvertent because some of it is just people pushing it. Or as another movie character would say, they're the ones that drew first blood, not him. The sergeant notices the pattern is developing. None of the other cops think it is. They're all like, ah, it's your retirement day jitters. 
but eventually it gets to the point where a couple of the other cops can't deny it, and they start to see where it is, and that's how they figure out, once they figure out it's defense, they're like, so that's where he's going. And they get to each other, to each other, and they have their little confrontation on the pier in Venice Beach, and when they're confronting each other, I just love the line the defense has, and what sells it is the way Michael Douglas enunciates the words, and he's like, I'm the bad guy? Yeah, with everything that's gone on, technically, yeah, because... When you think about everything that's gone on, even, uh, I know it's a little minor spoilers with it, but it's stuff I brought up already. The only two acts of violence he does throughout the whole film that are completely justified are attacking the Cholos, because if he had not given them anything, they were probably going to try to rob and beat the crap out of him. And some of the stuff involving the, uh, racist guy at the uh, surplus store whether or not killing him that's going to depend on how you look at it but for the movie it's like a good moment kind of like how in robocop the title character throwing clarence around was a moment uh the blowing up the thing even though it does kind of go into a thing that when a lot of us see road work being done we're like yeah that's probably why they're doing it Eh, not really justified, other than the fact that it actually creates legit road work for them to fix. The golf thing, I mean, he gave the guy a heart attack, so is it really justified? No. Even if it is him making the point about it. Of course, him beating up the convenience store owner, not really uh, justified, especially since he's uh, disturbing the peace. Assault and battery. Depending how you want to look at it, potentially assault with a deadly weapon, because he did use a bat. It's going to depend on how you argue how he used that bat. Uh, destruction of property. Even though he paid for the soda, I guess you could probably throw in some other type of charge there. It's going to depend on how the penal codes are written. But, yeah, it's not really warranted. Like I said, you go to a convenience store, you pay that. It's, I bet you could say the markup's a convenience fee. Pun definitely intended. Now, the screenplay was written by, and I hope I'm pronouncing this first name correctly, Ebe Rose Smith, who, this is the only major thing this screenwriter wrote. I uh, wrote something else called Partners and another movie I didn't even put in the notes. He was like, eh, not really worth mentioning if they're not that big. And Smith sent this script, or it went around Hollywood, and every studio turned it down for one reason or another, which... Since I'm going mainly off the finished film, it's one of those things where it's like, huh? But then again, we got to remember how the finished film look, looked, looks, excuse me, does not really reflect in how the screenplay is written. Sometimes it can, but other times you can take a screenplay that could be in the hands of a lesser director, a dull, lifeless flop, but in the hands of an auteur or a semi auteur. It becomes excellent. I mean, I mean, bring up RoboCop again. Remember, Paul Verhoeven at one point was going to turn the film down because he thought it was just, you know, a dumb Hollywood action movie. But then it was his wife who convinced him that the film had layers and look at how good that film is. I mean, it has all the fun of a B-movie, but it has that subtextual stuff, the layers, because of Verhoeven's direction. How he combined all the elements. Now here, with Schumann, Walker, you got a little bit of that too. Now, it was producer Arnold Co Copelson, excuse me, if I can read my notes right. <laughs> he was getting to the stage of considering it for cable television when it came across Michael Douglas's desk, and he decided, you know what, this is one of the best scripts I've ever read. I would like to see this get done. And then it just went from there. And before the film came out, uh, Smith actually had an interview talking about it where he gave his interpretation of what the movie was about. And, of course, this is one of those things that... This is where some of the subtext is, but it is brought to life a little bit in how both Michael Douglas plays his character, a little bit of how Duvall plays his character, especially with his decision at the end of the film, and how Joel Schumacher shot the film and how he had the film edited together and all that, his shots. And I quote, to me, even though the movie deals with complicated urban issues, which as an aside it does, it really is just about one basic thing. The main character represents the old power structure of the U.S. that has now become archaic and hopelessly lost. For both of them, it's a just or die time. Now, 
we're just reading that, you're like, hmm? Part of it seems to tie into defense losing his job, what his job was. And uh, they mentioned that he used to defend the world when it comes to America, so he probably was one of those people that was employed and heavily doing their job during the Cold War, now that we're, at least when this movie is, was made and set, in the early stages of the end of the Cold War, even though this is pre-War on Terror, so some of this is not aged as well as it probably could have or should have, depending on how you want to look at it. At the time, this would look at as an archaic thing, and him losing his job in a post-Cold War world, you can see. It's one of those things you got to adapt with the times. So it is a little bit of a commentary on American society and how we got to adapt in a post-Cold War world. And defense is the personification of people who are not taking it well, not liking all the other stuff, and then lashing out in the wrong direction, even if some of the stuff they do has a point. Like as an aside, defense is a little thing about, how come it never looks as good in person as it does in the picture? Plump in the picture. Love like that. Now, Michael Douglas, like I mentioned, excellent performance here. I can't gush enough about how good he is in this one. I haven't seen all of his films. If I had to do a top five, this would definitely be in the running and probably in the top five. And I'm not alone. Both Michael Douglas and his father, Kirk Douglas, at different points, consider this to be one of his best performances. And you can see why. All right. And with this character, there's actually a very subtle metaphor that I didn't, I didn't really catch until IMDb put it out on there, and this is it. And that is that the bags that, that his character carries, that's the metaphor. The briefcase represents his responsible side, while the gym bag filled with guns represents his turn to disorganization and violence. So when you tie it back in past the urban issue to the whole power structure thing, the briefcase could be him accepting the fact that the world is changing and him deciding to adjust with it, either slowly or rushing into it and probably failing a little bit along the way, but finally getting there. Whereas the little gym bag of guns represents him going in a completely bad direction, which, not to try to keep modern day politics in the world out of it, there's a lot of ways you can look at it that way, but I'm just going to leave it there, let you all connect the dots yourself, especially from how things have been the last few years. In that regard, he just him grabbing the gym bag and leaving the briefcase is defense basically giving up his old life and giving in to the impulses of violence. The nice little subtle metaphor there with the bags and like I said, one of those things in a lesser director's hand it might not have come across as strongly. Or it could be one of those death of the author things in a lesser's hands. Uh, Robert Duvall, like I said, excellent is this in this role. Uh, Barbara Hershey, good job as Beth. I'm not gonna go over all the actors, I've mentioned them already. Uh, there's a couple other little bits of trivia here. I didn't get all of them, but these are the two big ones. Actually, three big ones. I'm going to start with this one since it ties back into the acting. And that was, this film was criticized as racist due to its portrayal of minorities. This is a, a bit of contention that I heard about when I first saw this movie over a decade ago. And it's one reading it now, I'm like, I can kind of see it. But at the same time, it's like they're not really portrayed as what I would call racist. I mean, you could say there's some stereotypical stock characters in there. I mean, the Cholos are the stereotypical hoodlum characters, but... And they are played up, of course, obviously, to sell the fact, even though, though you could kind of look at it and go, that's the way that defense is interpreting them. If it was a point of view chapter in a book, we would definitely say that's how he's viewing them. That might not be how they are, so grain of salt. Now, it is turned up, but remember, people who act like Cholos do exist. I'm not going to say in what number, because obviously someone will point to someone and say, well, you're wrong. But they do. As for the Korean guy that runs a convenience store, he didn't really seem racist to me. And we all know there are convenience store owners, especially the independent convenience stores, that mark up their prices. That's nothing new. 
to show that and just have the owner happen to be Korean is not racist. So for that, I think the Korean American Coalition protesting film for that and getting the movie banned in South Korea was a stupid decision. Now, the funny thing is, this is one of those movies that's actually lambasted by both sides. You can imagine it's primarily the left calling this movie racist. But it was also condemned by conservatives as anti-white propaganda. Which, <laughs> considering some of the political commentary I've mentioned that this film contains, you can kind of see why somebody would say that. But it's one of those things that, like, wow... You're really going to have to go and say it's anti-white just because you didn't like the message of the movie? Wow, you really are reaching. And you can see why loosely I was mentioning some of that other stuff about how you could view this film in retrospect, some of its messages, and how uh, dangerous some of that attitude can get. Make it out what you will. Now, this is another thing I never noticed, which I probably should have, considering I saw this character before I saw this character. But apparently... In the episode of The Simpsons, Homer's Enemy, the character of Frank Grimes was designed to look like Michael Douglas in this movie, which is interesting because both men were fed up and impatient with society. The only way that could have been even better is if they had gotten Michael Douglas to voice him, but that might have been a little bit too much on the nose. Now here's a nice little bit of uh, interesting commentary right here. The movie was being shot on location in Linwood, California when the 1992 L.A. riots began. And by April 30th, the riots were significantly disruptive to force filming to stop early that day. And of course, they produced more footage inside of the Warner Brothers studio in Burbank as the riots continued. And by May 4th, when the crew intended to resume in Pasadena, initial requests to do so were denied, and that caused delays. And the tension around the riots was something in the, that the filmmakers deemed to have had effect on the final film. And I, to connect back to the previous one, I think that right there is probably the main reason why the left, with their criticism, was like, this film is racist. But the thing about that, I wonder, is like, why weren't they calling it racist for how it shows African-American characters? I mean, we only have them in a couple scenes, and they're the scenes as he's going through L.A., like the scene with the rocket launcher, and the kid happens to know how to fire it because he watched, uh, I think it was Beverly Hills Cop 3. Or man, I don't know. I think that, I don't know if that was out yet. Beverly Hills Cop 2, I think it was. Now, obviously, I haven't seen those movies yet, even though I own them. So, forgive me if I get the numbers wrong, but one of them. Something like that. If they had jumped out and be like, oh, no, that's not racist. It's just a kid who is a kid of culture. And then, of course, the scene where the black guy who's dressed just like defense gets arrested. I'm surprised they didn't try to call that racist, but... Maybe because of his speech about not being economically viable and being a little more of a critique on the situation of the day. But to go with it, it's that scene right there. You could definitely feel the L.A. riots in the background of the film. And how it's kind of a little shadow on it from a time and place one. Which dates the film a little bit, but at least it's not as far into thing to where it 100% dates it. And that's really all the notes I got. Overall, Falling Down is an excellent film. Definitely a good... Uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought with the word there. It's a good little examination into the downward spiral of somebody with some good little political commentary, some of which can still be viewed as relevant today. We've got a pretty good uh, hero character who's about the same age as our antagonist, uh, I don't even know whether you could call, say antagonist or protagonist in this, since the main character is technically, the, when you look at it, the villain of the piece. I guess you could say our main character and then his adversary to make it sound a little bit better. All the side characters are good. The writing is spot on, and the direction by Joel Schumacher makes it flow very well. And just how he frames everything, there is a good amount of humor in there. Some of which has aged a little bit because of the fact they've changed stuff. Like I mentioned, the changing of the breakfast hours for fast food restaurants. But if you live through the time period, it is still pretty funny. And it could also be one of those things that if you're explained the context of the joke, you get it more. Like, for example, Blading Saddles. A lot of those jokes probably go over some people's heads until they actually understand the reference. Randolph Scott... Oh, he was a Western guy. Oh, Jesse Owens? Okay, that's why that's funny. Stuff like that. 
And as you probably already guessed, it does get the Mars stamp of approval, and it comes with my high recommendation of watching. The only thing I wish is that we had more special features on this DVD. I mean, we only got a couple things in there. You know, having like a big old making of would be nice. But considering, you know, some of the troubles I mentioned around the LA riots when they were filming it, I can understand why there probably isn't one. Although it would be nice to see them kind of delve into like some of the controversy of this film on a documentary. Get their thoughts on it. Get their thoughts on how both the left and the right are viewing this film and how relevant this film was at the time. And now it would be a nice little interesting documentary. Maybe in, done in the vein of uh, the documentaries they did on the Alien Quadrilogy set. Well, that's about it. Till next time, guys.